What's up, guys? Hey, I'm in a well. Um, yeah, we got uh, all kinds of reverb going in here. Um, talking about effects pedals today, and uh, I neglected to grab my notes. Hold that thought. I'll be right back. They're right here. I'm better with my notes. I'm just gonna read them like this. Hope that's okay for everybody. Hey, um, so we're uh, we're back at Electric Violin Shop. So Wednesday, it's three o'clock. You, you're here, I'm here. Awesome, thank you for coming. Uh, we got Facebook on one side, uh, YouTube on the other, and we are using a different device on Facebook this week. So you should be able to hear me. Hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, we did a poll on Instagram, uh, on Instagram stories a couple weeks ago where we were asking about different topics that you might want to hear about so that I threw out there. So this one is going to be on the basics of effects pedals. We're not getting super deep today. I'm not going to talk about like all the different kinds of effects pedals. Uh, we're just going to sort of talk about how to basically hook them up and what order you might want to put them in. And, um, you know, just some, some sort of beginner type concerns. So if you are an experienced uh, stopbox user, you might want to hang out, even though I'm probably not going to teach you anything new that you don't know, but you might be able to chime in with uh, some information for me. I do use a couple of stomp boxes in my live rig, um, but I'm mostly a multi-effects guy. I use a Helix. Uh, I do have two stomp boxes that I use with my Helix. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I have throughout the years used stomp boxes, but the, the most portion of like my 20 year touring career has mostly been uh, multi effects. So, um, if you're an experienced stomp box person, you may be able to chime in with some, uh, some very helpful information here for everybody else. Um, so, let's say that we have decided, we've sort of looked at do I want to use like a Boss Katana amp that has some built-in effects. Do I want to use a, um, um, do I want to use a, um, a multi-effects or do I want to use stomp boxes? And that's a discussion we're really not going to cover today. Um, but um, once you've decided that you are going to use stomp boxes, these are some things you want to think about. One second. Uh, si necesito un violín en Peru, uh, puede llamarnos aquí eh, a la tienda o puede ir a nuestro sitio de red y pero, uh, puede comprar un violín en este sitio. Es electricviolinshop.com y podemos enviar a Perú. No hay problema con eso y espero que se ayuda. Okay. I uh, just had a question over here on, on the YouTube side from somebody in Peru looking for a violin. And uh, si sí, podemos ayudar. No hay problema. Um, oh. I will say I was watching back on the live stream that I did earlier um, when I did my preview. What's up, Alaska? I love Alaska. So beautiful up there. Um, I went at the bottom. Oh, yeah, thanks, man. Um, I went to the bottom of the Facebook side. There's like a little gear there at the bottom right. You punch on that, click on it, and you, uh, it can, you can go captioning. You can pull up captioning if you guys really want something entertaining. You can see whether uh, Zuckerberg can understand my Texas accent or not. Uh, o mi español. puede. No sé. Um, so, um, yeah. So maybe that's some good old-fashioned entertainment for you guys. I think you can do it on YouTube, too. Maybe they've got captioning on there. Sometimes these jokes come kind of fast. You catch them better if they're on closed captioning. Maybe they'll be funnier if you see them written out. Um... So one thing to think about with pedals, if we're going to use stomp boxes, normally you will see people with, uh, you know, more than one. Okay. So a thing to think about when we're using stomp boxes is that each pedal adds a level of complexity to your rig. And it's not like a little bit more, it's a lot more. Okay. And when we start getting into talking about three, four, five, six pedals, all the different permutations of how they can be in different orders, you start getting into a lot of possibilities, okay? The other thing is I have to power these pedals. Each pedal requires power. And while if you only have a couple pedals, 
you can use one of the daisy chains. Uh, you know, you can use a, uh, a one spot power adapter to supply your pedals. You could also use nine volts if you've got a really big budget and you don't mind throwing uh, $2 worth of batteries into each pedal for each show. Um, you know, if you're Eric Johnson, you can do that. Uh, my budget um, is a little tighter than that. So I would rather use a one spot for power and you can daisy chain a couple pedals together with one of the little, you know, it's a deal like next to your one spot and it's got several, um, some like a little power strip. Um, the problem is those can be really noisy. And if you're trying to power four or five pedals off of that one little thing, you might hear a, you know, a little hum in there. Uh, hums are bad. Um, so we try to avoid those. If you're getting a hum from your from the power of your pedals, if you've got too many of them and you're trying to power off of one thing, you may need to buy an isolated power supply, which means that thing plugs into the wall and then it's got isolation where you're gonna run a, a little line from that ISO box to each one of, uh, um, to each one of your pedals. Uh, mira, los precios que tenemos aquí puede ver en nuestro sitio uh, de red y cada uno tiene una página separada. Si se va a electricviolinshop.com Puede saber uh, todo sobre que lo, lo, que ten, uh, lo que tenemos, okay? O puede mandar un correo electrónico a uh, info arroba electricviolinshop.com, okay? Y podemos ayudarle allá. Um, so, yeah, we got to power each of these pedals. So power is a thing, and it can be a little bit complicated. Um, uh, sí, puede usar el Google... Para, para traducir a Dolores a uh, la moneda uh, peruvia, ¿ok? Gracias para, para venir. Um, so, yeah, you got to power each of these pedals, and that can kind of become a problem in and of itself. The other thing you got to think about is um, signal strength. Each pedal is going to require a certain level of signal coming into it for it to work properly, and then it's usually going to have a volume on it. Um, just... So like this has, it's gonna expect a certain volume in, and then you've got a certain volume output of this, right? And then that feeds the next pedal. So that pedal also has a window of signal strength that it's expecting to see. And if you start overriding pedals, if I over, if I starve one, then it's not gonna act right. If I overdrive it, it's not gonna act right. The thing is none of these pedals have meters on them to say, hey, your signal coming in is too strong. Um, you're just going to have to kind of experiment with it. So the more pedals you have, the more of these volume knobs, you got to kind of figure out exactly where they need to be in your chain so that you're not starving. Um, so that's a complicated thing. And then, you know, once you put them in your pedal board and you close the thing up, and you go to the next city and you open it up, half the time these knobs have all moved. Yeah, it's not a bad idea once you get these things sort of pegged in. And then sometimes you're, you're, uh, you're a Joe Denizon or you're a... Uh, you're a Rob Flax or one of those guys who's a, who's a knob turner, right? So you're getting all the sounds you want, but then you bend down and turn it. Those things, that changes a lot when it's going through your, your thing. Uh, Joe Denizon and Rob Flax, those guys are, um, whew, those guys are really talented. And, and they've memorized all the different permutations of, of how these things pass through. So, um, um, uh, Cesar, if you were going to start using a pedal, do you recommend start with a used or with a simple one? Um, yeah, I mean, that's not a bad idea to start with either a used pedal or if you're just getting started, I would actually recommend a multi-effects, uh, like an ME80, because then you don't have to worry about powering 10 different pedals in there. You don't have to worry about order. You don't have to worry about one thing starving or overdriving the next. You can just sort of experiment with different sounds. Um, if you're a beginner to effects, I would probably start with an ME80. Um, if you've already decided to go the route of stomp boxes, though, that's what this discussion is going to be about. So you got to make sure that your levels are right, that you're not starving or overdriving the next pedal. And then all those, again, they stack up. So you got to keep that going. Yeah, no problem. Um, so signal strength, what order you got them in, all the connections. Every time you have an analog connection here, an analog connection here, and then there's two cables, a cable coming in and a cable coming out, you have an opportunity for a problem, okay? Um, so if that cable comes unseated during transport, it may not even look like it's unseated. 
It may only be, oops, I shouldn't have done that. Um, so it, it may only be out that much. That That's not a good connection. You're either going to get a hum or you're not going to get any signal at all. And if you got 10 of these on your board and you look down and you go, they're all plugged in. Oh, well, yeah. Now it's plugged in. So you could have a problem. Um, that can be really, really frustrating. So the more pedals you have, the more opportunities there are for that. Okay. Um, and then each physical connection, you lose a little tiny bit of signal. There is some signalization. If you, I don't know if you guys saw like the world record um, pedal board was some guitar player, probably a church guy, uh, had this huge like 400 pedal pedal board. Forget how he's powering that thing. All those connections to those things, I, I don't know how you get any signal through. You can talk about tr true bypass all you want, but. If you've got 400 physical connections going from one place to another, that the reliability on that pedal board is low, okay? Um, so all the connections, all those different cables, cables can go bad. They introduce noise into things. Um, it, it, can be, it can be an issue. Now, I'm not telling you not to go with stomp boxes. A, a lot of people get amazing sounds out of their stomp boxes, and the only way to get those sounds is from their stomp boxes. There are just a lot of things to be concerned with. It's not like, hey, we're just going to hook these up and go. Uh, Tracy Silverman and I just had a discussion. Uh, his podcast episode came out like yesterday or the day before. Uh, the Rockstar Doing With Your Life. Um, please listen to the Rockstar Violinist podcast. It's really awesome. You can It's soundcloud.com slash rockstar violinist. Or find it on Google Play. Find it on iTunes. You can find it on Stitcher. Um, Anyway, one of the things that Tracy was talking about is that it's just hundreds and hundreds of hours, thousands of hours goes into finding the exact sound that you want. Um, so people, hey, you know, what setting should I use? Man, I can maybe tell you what I'm doing to give you a, maybe a place to get started, but that came from hundreds of hours of experimentation and what I think sounds good may not be what you think sounds good. And maybe we're going to a different amp or coming from a different instrument. Maybe I play lighter or harder than you do. So what my settings are, it's kind of like asking me what, what my favorite shoe is. I mean, I like Chucks, but they may not feel good on your feet. So um, you probably don't wear a size 13. So um, yeah, it's, it's all going to be things that you've got to figure out, okay? Rule number one, if it sounds good, it is good. So no matter how you get to the place you're going, if you like the way your rig sounds, then that's good. So, you know, there are a lot of what we would, I would say rules. There's not that many rules in, in here, except, you know, you should probably use 110 volt electricity if, if that's what your thing's designed for. Um, there are a lot more suggestions. Um, and maybe uh, conventions. We'll talk about like the way you would order your pedals here in a minute. That's more convention than it is a rule. And we'll talk about what some of the reasons are for that. Um, but if you like to do yours completely backwards from the way I do it, that doesn't make it wrong. If you're happy with the way it sounds, if it sounds good, it is good. Okay. That's the definition of good is that it sounds good. Okay. Um, so, oh, I did want to talk about one more thing. When we're talking about individual stomp boxes, because each pedal that you add to your train adds some complicating factors. Uh, I got to power it. I got more connections. I've got to think about signal strength, order, all that thing. You know, so there, there is a level of complexity that goes up every time you add a pedal. You got to decide if it's worth it, okay? So minimalism may be uh, sort of the name of the game on pedals. We're not going to just throw a bunch of pedals in there because they're in my closet. Um, hey, I just won't use them. Well, you could be creating problems for your rig if you've got a bunch of pedals on there just in case. You, you probably, if you're a pro player, a touring player, a person who's doing this for money, um, you probably don't want to have a bunch of pedals on there just because you own them because uh, that can create a lot of problems. Um, so rule number one, if it sounds good, it is good. Uh, I'm looking down because I forgot to tape my notes up here. I'm sorry. If you need a preamp for impedance reasons, and we've talked about this extensively in other places, I'm not going to get into it much today. The preamp has to be first. It has to be the very first thing your instrument plugs into. 
not not a wireless, not uh, you know, not anything. If if you need a preamp for impedance reasons, then it has to be absolutely first. Okay, and if you're using something, I didn't know if I had one sitting now. If you're using something like a bags, uh, the Paracoustic DI that also has the XLR output. So I need that to be first and I need it to be last if that's my DI. So gosh, how do I do that? Well, there is an effects loop in there. And I guess I should talk about um, what a insert pedal or an insert cable is. An insert cable, mute it over here, all right. An insert cable, if you look at this cable here, this is a mono cable. I've got a, I've got a tip and I've got a sleeve. Okay, it's a mono cable. There's only two connections here. There's two wires inside here. An insert cable will have a stereo plug on one end, which means there's another ring around here, and it's called tip ring sleeve. So there's a tip, a ring in the middle, and then a sleeve. That's, that's a stereo cable. It's got three wires in it, which means I've got a hot, I've got a plus and minus and a neutral, okay? So in a stereo cable, you can actually simultaneously send a signal down and back on that same, through that same connector, because there are three connectors inside the Paracoustic DI on the effects send. Okay, so you see some will have an effects send and return, it'll be two separate jacks. And then some will just say effects loop, and it's only one jack. You need a stereo, and if you go to, um, I'm not gonna name it, but it rhymes with Metarschmenter. If you go to that, horrible place and uh, ask them for an insert cable there's a 20% chance they'll even know what that is but it'll be a stereo jack on one end and then it'll it'll split and go to two mono jacks like this on the other end so you go into the insert portion of your your bags di and then you'll have uh, one will say tip and one will say uh, one will say ring and one will say sleeve You'll have to experiment and you'll figure out which one's in and out because when you put it backwards, it won't work at all. Uh, so, okay, that didn't work. So you flip it and you know, okay, that one's in, this one's out. Um, so then what's happening is it's sending out, going to one, to one pedal, and then it comes back, goes back through that same cable back into the bags. Hope that makes sense. Um, so that's what's happening if, in your effects loop of a preamp if it only has one jack. You need a insert cable, stereo on one end, dual mono on the other, okay? All right, I forgot that I had to get into that and I didn't have any notes. So, um, so it is totally legal to, um, <laughs> thanks Rob. Um, it is totally legal to try running your pedals in any order that you want. And if you like that, fine. If you want to change orders around, that's fine. It won't hurt anything to, to change the order of your pedals. Worst case scenario is it sounds bad, okay? And that's not the end of the world. You're going to do a lot of stuff in your practice room that sounds bad. Um, you should be doing a lot of stuff in your practice room that sounds bad. You're going to sound bad somewhere. It should be in your practice room, not on stage. Um, so, yeah, try stuff in your practice room, and, uh, and that's going to be good. So... We talked about uh, isolating power supplies to keep these things powered. Buy high quality cables. If you've got a bunch of pedals, you need to connect them all. Buy high quality cables, not cheap cables. Don't buy the little cheap $5 patch cables if you've got a bunch of them. Because uh, you know what cables do? They go bad. So buy expensive, like the monster cables that you can make your own and stuff. That's what you're going to want if you've got a bunch of pedals on your board. And then have a couple of spares and get there early and plug your stuff in and make sure it's working because you're going to be doing a lot of troubleshooting. So just be prepared for that. Oh, and if you've got your, you okay, let's, okay, you know what? Here's another thing I didn't have on my notes. Notes are stupid anyway. Um, let's talk about pedal boards. Rather than coming in with five or six loose pedals and then a bunch of power wires laying all over and we got to hook this up and I'm going to hook all the, you know, I'm going to hook all this stuff up when I get there least professional thing ever. Please, please do not do that. That's, oh God, that's awful. Please don't do that. Get a pedal board yeah. and you can make a pedal board out of, out of anything if you don't, if you don't want to, 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 you know, to go buy a pedal board. I mean, you can make one out of a cutting board if you want. Just take your mom's cutting board, tell her I said it was okay. Uh, it'll be fine. She can send me a note, whatever. Um, just grab a, something flat. And you can put some Velcro or there's this other stuff. Um, 
I got it at uh, Bone Beepo. They're not paying me, so I'm not using their name. But it rhymes with Bone Beepo. Uh, you can go there, and it's like a 3M material. It sort of looks like Velcro, but it's you got the rough side of Velcro and then the soft, furry side. This stuff looks like the rough side on both, but the rough on both sides, they lock together. It's, uh, I forget what it's called. Rob might remember. Um, but the, it's, man, it's five times as strong as Velcro. So use that to lock your pedals down. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do this. Velcro is generally not strong enough. Um, the one that I use, I actually have to keep a, a, a knife or something so I can pop my pedals off because you, you can't just pull on them. They won't come off. You have to reach under and lever them off. Um, but, uh, yeah, use that to lock your pedals down. But know that you are probably going to have to leave enough space in between them to be able to get your patch cables in and out. Or you're going to have to be able to pop those pedals off the board. Um, so get a pedal board. Lock your pedals down onto that thing with Velcro or some alternative to Velcro. And then get everything pre-wired so that you don't have to be in. It doesn't take you 30 minutes to set up every time. That's, that's garbage. If it takes you more than five minutes from the time you walk onto the stage with your stuff in a bag to the time you're playing and send in signal, you need to simplify somehow, some way. Five minutes. If you can't do it in five minutes, you got to change something. Um... So, so that's pedal boards. Let's, if you're gonna have more than a couple pedals, you need pedal boards with stuff pre-wired and ready to go. That, it decreases the chances that something's gonna go bad too. Um, you know, because if that cable's in there and it never comes out, it's less likely that you're gonna have a goofy connection, okay? So let's talk about the order of pedals and why that matters. Um, let's do this. All right, so I've got a organ machine and a reverb, all right? Hear how pretty that is? I'm gonna turn it up a little bit. Um, uh, hear that nice wash that comes out after that? I've got the organ pedal running into the reverb. Let's switch that just for fun. And gosh, what difference could it possibly make if I see I'm coming out of there? Into here, out of here. Okay, and then I'm out of here, into here. So now I'm running from into the reverb first, and then the organ pedal. Gosh, what difference could it make? Reverb first, organ pedal first. Who cares, right? More or less sounds the same, right? Except. Listen to the end. You hear how that, that reverb is sort of garbly? It's because the trail of that reverb is now feeding the organ machine. And you're hearing what that organ machine actually does. Um, you don't want to hear that. Well, I mean, maybe you do. And that's the thing. There's no rules. If you like this sound better, hook it up that way. <laughs> Me, personally, I would do it the other way, and we'll go back, go back to the other way. Out of the wireless, into the organ machine, organ machine into the reverb. All right, unmute the amp. Okay, here's, here's what I hear. I like to hear that clean reverb sound instead of a maybe you like that. I don't know. That's fine. And if that's what you like, then hey, run it that way and hope they keep paying you. Um, so that's what it means to run one, why the order matters. Okay. I'm going to do another example because uh, examples are fun. Let's, uh, let's do, I had a big muff in my hand here. Let's run into that. Let's go from the organ machine into the big muff. Because, you know, a lot of times those rock organs, they actually put distortion on those things, right? You know, you got, yeah, the organ sounds nice. It's a little bit, a little churchy maybe, right? What if we want it to be a rock organ? Put some distortion on that thing, right? So here we go. Let's see, what went wrong here? Oh. 
So that's one way. That's pretty crunchy. Um, let's hear some more of that. Okay, that's one way. That's organ into distortion. Okay, let's flip it. What could possibly go wrong? Let's go distortion first, and then organ. How about that? Could it possibly make a difference? I don't know. <laughs> a lot more intelligible. To me, the other way was it was like it was too dirty. I don't know if that's a thing even. But it was it was just it was just it didn't have any real intelligibility. This way it has more. It's still got that it's got that edge to it. That's why order matters, okay? Because feeding a distortion into an organ machine is different than feeding an organ machine into a distortion. And it's also the same thing. Oh, Daniel, hey, what's up, buddy? Um, been falling in any swimming pools lately? People fall into swimming pools when I'm at the pool party because I hip check them. That's what I do. I throw people into pools. I'm sure that surprises every one of you guys. If you are at a pool party with me, you should probably leave your phone in the car. Unless you got a waterproof phone because you're probably going in the pool. Um, that's why it's there. We didn't put the thing there for people who are not swimming it. I don't care what you're wearing. Um, anyway, so yeah, feeding an organ machine to a distortion is different than feeding a distortion to an organ machine. And then organ to reverb was different than reverb into organ. And you can tell as I get seven or eight pedals on here, all of a sudden, all these orders, there's a lot of different ways to hook them up. Well, you know, it's gonna take some experimentation on your part to, uh, to make that happen, but here's where I go when I do mine, okay? Preamp, obviously, if I need it for, um, if I need it for uh, impedance reasons, obviously, we've already talked about it has to be first, 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 first. Otherwise, you can use your uh, preamp for EQ or for tone, and you can put it wherever you want, okay? Um, but if you need it for impedance reasons, it has to be the very first thing that you plug into, okay? Then, I go tuner, First, except, um, and, it, and if uh, if you guys aren't hip to the whole tuning pedal thing, bro, you got to get a tuning pedal. Um, first of all, um, especially if you play extended range like I do, I've, I've got a six string. Um, if I tune to A440 and then I try to use my ear to do the rest of them, it turns out that the perfect fifth is actually slightly larger when you tune it by ear that interval is actually slightly larger than what equal temperament would have you use, okay? So if I'm tuning A, my A is at 440 and I'm gonna to tune to a D using my ear, that D is gonna be a little bit flat compared to a D on a tuner. And then when I tune the G off of that, then it's gonna be a little flatter. And then the C is gonna be a little flatter and the F is gonna be flatter. By the time I get down to my F, I'm probably a quarter step flat. Um, so the uh, the issue with that is that all the guys in my band are using tuners for all six strings of their guitar. And a keyboard player, if I have one, heaven forbid, he's using equal temperament tuning. So we can talk just temperament all you want and how, hey, that's how Bach or Mozart would have done it. Well, Bach ain't in my band. And if I'm out of tune compared to the guys in my band, who do you think is going to get looked at, them or me? Me. So, um, 
You want to use equal temperament. Make sure you're tuning each string with a tuner if you're playing in a rock band, not tune A and then use your ear to do the rest, okay? Because you're actually going to be out of tune compared to the people in your band, and that's a whole nother discussion. But if you want to get paid, use a tuner, okay? The tuner goes first, 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 because all of these different things, you hear that organ wobble, or roar, 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 roar. what do you think that's going to do to a tuner? Your tuner is going to have no idea where your A is. Tuner is first, first, first. Now, what I do is I, I use a wireless, uh, a classic G50, that actually has two outputs. It's got an output that feeds my pedal train, and then it's got an output actually designed for a tuner. It's just a dead leg. It goes out and then hits the tuner and stops, and that's the end of that signal path. So I send a split signal out to my tuner, and I leave my tuner on the whole time. Uh, the band that I was in, we were song to song to song to song. There's no, there's no stopping. The drummer finishes, boom, he's into the next song. In fact, half the time, the last measure of the song we were in, he was starting the first measure of the next tune, okay? That band did not stop. So that's why we're getting paid. So, so you don't have time to stop between songs and tune, okay? So if you are lucky and you play in a band that plays a lot of stuff in G, D, A, and E, you know, keys that fiddle players like, you're not in a horn band where everything's an E flat or B flat, um, you're going to use some open strings during the course of every song. Well, heck, if you're playing an open, just look down and see if it's in tune. If you've got a tuner dead-legged off of your rig somewhere, then that tuner can be hot all the time. And whenever you hit an open string, you just look down and see if you're in tune. And that way you can keep track of your tuning while you're playing, and it's not like a thing we've got to stop every now and then. Okay? And that was actually a fourth, so that was like a guitar. Um, so tuners first, if you do have it in line with all your pedals, tuners first. Um, the other nice thing a tuner can do for you is normally when you kick your tuner, it kills the signal out to the rest of your, um, your rig. So it's a good mute pedal. So if you need to plug or unplug, you just kick that tuner, mutes everything, and then you can do whatever you need to do without, uh, without sending a signal to front of house. Tuners first. Then if I'm going to do any pitch shifting, if I've got a pitch fork or a pog or a drop pedal, that comes next. Or a harmonist, that comes next. So we got to get that pitch shifting done before we start feeding anything else. Um, because you want that cleanest possible signal coming in. So let's leave that sucker as clean as we can right out of the tuner or right out of the preamp into the pitch shifter. Um, and that's going to give your pitch shifter the best chance of, of, getting their, um, of getting their act together. Okay? So then I come out, I, you can put the EQ wherever you want. I generally put my EQ right after pitch shifting, and it's because I want the best possible signal to be going to all my other stuff, okay? So I really don't do a lot of EQ on my signal. I got a violin that sounds good. Um, so the only thing I really do with my EQ is I knock a little off the low end, a little off the high end. Um, so I come out and it's, um, I got my tuner, pitch shifting, and then EQ. So we'll do the high pass filter, a little bit of low pass filter. Then I go to my impulse response if I'm going to have one. Some of my tones use one, some of them don't. Um, and then out of that, you're saying delay. Yeah, after, after EQ or an impulse response, then I go to my delay. Okay? Um, after the delay, then uh, I may throw in a, a wah. You could put your wah before the delay or after. Either one's fine. Um, just sort of experiment and see which one uh, works best for you. Anytime I use a wah, I'm also using a compressor um, because wahs are super, super peaky. Um, the problem is, like, when you kick on your... For me, I use a different preset on my multi-effects, but if I was using a pedal board, I'd have to sort of figure out how when I kicked on my wah, I would also kick on my compressor. And then when I kicked off my wah, I would also kick off my compressor. It's sort of going to be a two-step thing for me. Um, and then after that, I would go to my amp. And then after the amp, I would go to reverb. Um, and it's for me, because I'm using a virtual amp, I can put the reverb wherever I want. I want the reverb as close to the end of the chain as possible, because I don't want to be feeding reverb to any of my other pedals, okay? 
If you're using mods, if you're using uh, choruses, flangers, phasers, um, I try to get those relatively early, generally before the delay. So I might come out of uh, pitch shifting EQ, then a chorus, a phaser, flanger, then delay, and then uh, wah or distortion or whatever I'm going to put after that, and then reverb at the very end. Um, if you're using a volume pedal, which I highly recommend using a volume pedal, that is just an insane amount of control for you. Um, so many pedals are affected by the level that they receive, distortion being one of them. Um, distortion, the, the, the hotter you feed a distortion pedal, the more the output distorts. So if you, you'll see guitar players who do this, they actually, when they're turning down their volume on their guitar, it very seldom gets much quieter. Guitar players never turn it down. We don't want to turn it down. I mean, why would I want to be quiet? That's stupid. Um, they're actually, when they're turning their volume down, they're not making the guitar quieter. I mean, they, the guitar's getting quieter, but the rig is not getting quieter. What they're doing when they turn down, they're actually starving their distortion pedal, which makes it distort less. So when they're turning down, they're actually turning distortion down. It's just cleaning up their sound. And then when they turn up, they're dirtying up their sound. So they'll usually be set so where that distortion pedal is, you know, it can accept a wide range of, of signals, but it's only going to pass a little bit. And we talked some about this last week uh, in the compression thing. Distortion pedals have a lot of compression in them. So you can feed a lot of signal to a distortion. It's just going to distort more. It can only send as much signal as it can send. It's just that that signal will be more distorted if you're overdriving it more. Once you clean, once you lower the input signal, it doesn't, it's still sending full signal. It's just cleaner than it was. So you can, because the guitar player can actually get away, he can hit that thing and then turn, right? I actually have to bow the whole note. So instead of being able to reach up and turn my volume knob on the violin, I will use my foot to do that. So um, you've got a nice mute on your tuner that's, that's a hard cut. You very seldom want to do that, though, except for between songs. I like to use my volume pedal to, to be able, at the end of a song, I can actually rock back on that and create sort of a nice fade. If I'm in a slow song or something, um, I can actually get a studio fade, and I can still play with some authority, and I can get all the timbre that I want, but as I'm rocking back on that volume pedal, my volume is dropping, okay? I can use that on my distortion patches. I put my volume pedal before the distortion pedal or the, or the amp so that I can clean it up or dirty it up just by using that volume pedal. Um, generally on my rig, I've got the volume pedal all the way at the end, even after um, reverb, so that I control, like if I want the whole my whole signal to come down even after the reverb, I've got control of that. I can shut it off. Um, there are times, though, maybe I want to kill my dry signal and just let that reverb ring out. In that case, I would put the volume pedal before my reverb. Now, in a multi-effects that you can program, I can have different um, presets where the volume pedal is in different places in that chain. If you're hardwiring your, your, your rig, stomp boxes, why not? You're going to have to decide where the volume pedal goes, and that's just where it's going to have to be. Um, I've seen people use multiple volume pedals. Maybe I've got one near the beginning and one at the end so that I can starve or overdrive certain pedals with my volume in, at the beginning, and then I can control my volume at the end. That's a totally legal thing to do. You can have more than one volume pedal in your rig if you want. Um, so that's where all that is. When you're trying to decide, am I going to feed a flanger to a delay or a delay to a flanger, just think about what each one of those pedals does. Do I want my delay, do I want it to be flanged or not? You know, so, or do I want it to be the other way around? Do I want a clean delay? So you just have to think about how all these work together. And then, you know what, try it. Try it one way and then try it the other. Honestly, this, this thing that I just did with the distortion and the, uh, the organ, my first thought when I started this was that I was going to like organ into distortion better. And I plugged it in and went, wow, oh, that sounds terrible. So I switched the, I switched them. I went distortion first and then into organ. And I went, oh, I didn't expect that. That's better than, that's better than I thought it was going to be. Um, because generally, um, I would have assumed that, you know, you'd want that organ sound, then we'll dirty it up a little. 
Um, it turns out it sounds better if you dirty it up and then send it to the organ machine. Who knew? Um, there's not any way to know for sure until you try it. So try it. Um, when you're playing, the organ is a perfect example of this. You want to think about what that effect does. Um, you can't just play, hey, I want to sound like an organ. That's not what an organ sounds like. Organs can't do that. You can't have one note, you know, you've got bend wheels on them, but you can't bend one and hold the other. That doesn't sound like an organ. There's no way that sounds like an organ. So you have to think like an organist thinks, and you have to understand what the constraints are that an organ has that a violin doesn't have. They can't really... So the other thing is there's not gonna be a lot of uh, slurring. Right? An organist actually triggered, they're hitting that note each time. That sounds more like an organ, well, an avobrado too. There's not really that. So, you know, you wanna play without it. Uh, the other thing that makes an organ, and this is the thing that, um, on this particular pedal, it sounds a bit like an organ with one note. It sounds a lot more like an organ when you play double stops. Right? So experiment with that pedal and like, how do I make it sound like what I want it to sound like? Okay, distortion is the same kind of thing. You wouldn't just turn distortion on. You gotta know that distortion sounds way different on double stops than it does on single notes. So you actually have to adapt your playing style. You have to change your note choices to make the pedal do what you want. It's not just kicked with that pedal, and it means taking time with that pedal to figure out what makes that, the pedal's like an, its own instrument. You have to figure out what makes that pedal do the thing that you want it to do, and then you're gonna have to adapt your playing style. Um, so it's not, pedals aren't magic. It's just, it's another, it's really another instrument that you sort of have to learn how to play, and you have to, you have to create a relationship with that thing so that you can learn how to play it, right? Um, you know, like, hey, I really wish it would do this thing. Well, I mean, it can't read your mind. So it, it's just a dumb pedal. It takes a signal and it turns it into a different signal and sends it out. So if you want a certain sound or a certain feel or a certain thing, you have to figure out what makes, how to talk to that pedal to make it do that thing. Um, so it's, a, it's an interactive relationship. So that's that. What else do I have? Um, ah, signal loopers. That was my last thing on my list. Um, there's a thing, so we all know about loopers, right? Where I can come in and you know do my little chopping thing and I kick it and it just rolls that chopping thing and I solo over it. If, I, if I'm not good at this, then it takes me a half an hour to build a loop that I'm gonna solo on for three minutes and everybody's gonna leave. Um, just a personal pet peeve. So there's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a phrase looper. There's a thing called a signal looper, which is different. So what we do normally is we run all our pedals in series, right? One pedal feeds the next, feeds the next, feeds the next, feeds the next, and then it goes to the amp, okay? A signal looper will allow you to run your pedals in parallel, which means that my chorus does not necessarily feed my reverb and then feeds my delay and then feeds my amp. I can feed the chorus and send that to the amp and then I can feed the delay also and send it to the amp so that they, they don't, the chorus doesn't go into the delay. The chorus goes and then there's also delay on the dry signal or you can set these things up where they basically become patch bay and you can program each one of those switches to feed however many or in what order you want. So a signal looper, if you have a very complex pedal board, a signal looper could be a thing where you basically leave all your pedals on all the time and then the signal looper controls which one gets fed and in which order. They're a more complicated but they give you infinitely more power on 
arranging your pedal board and they can clean a lot of stuff up. So you don't have all this hiss because you're feeding 11 pedals all the time. Even when they're off, some, you know, they're not supposed to make noise, but some of them still do. So uh, there's a thing called a signal looper that you can look into if you have a pretty complex pedal board and you want more control over how all these things interact with each other, okay? I am, I actually have a gig to get to, honestly, and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up so I can get to uh, my gig. But if you guys have more questions, if you've got some suggestions or some things that I said that maybe you disagree with, that's cool. Um, or if you want to add to anything I said, the comments section is a place to do that. I'll definitely be interacting with those comments after the fact. And um, yeah, so this would be a good uh, community discussion. Um, I think I'm here next week. Pretty sure I'm here next week. You know what? I may not be here next week. I may have another gig. Um, if that gig falls through, I'll definitely be back next week and I will uh, we'll teach on something else. And then I will definitely... Oh, Thanks, Daniel. Um, I will definitely be gone the following Wednesday. I'm going to be on a mission trip in Guatemala. So um, I might see you guys next week. If I don't, then I will see you in three weeks. All right. Thank you. Thank you all for hanging out. It's so nice to see all you guys popping into the room and chatting. And uh, I do get a lot of texts from you guys. Those of you that I, that I hang out with personally, um, get texts from you guys afterwards. Those are always encouraging. And uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out and we will see you guys. Oh, I want one other thing. If you are a content creator and you're creating some cool content, maybe you've got some reviews on amps or effects or violins or whatever. Even if you're, if you're doing something cool with an amplified violin and you want us to share that, um, send it to me. Send it to me on, uh, on Facebook, email, whatever, whatever contact you have for me, just send it to me. You can email it to the shop. Um, don't be offended. If we don't share, because we, we get a lot of these, okay? Um, and so we, we can't possibly share them all. But um, we do share some of them. And uh, we would love to have some content if you guys want to create some content. And maybe you've got a great review or something of a, of a pedal that, that we haven't seen or, uh, or whatever. Feel free to send that in and we will do our best uh, to share the ones that, uh, you know, they got to be technically, I can't be having a lot of hiss and noise in the background and um, if, if Susie's kid walks in the room while you're filming, that's cool. We'll keep that. Uh, she just did, uh, her kid just did that to Shauna. Shauna was filming a cello video the other day. We kept it and it was awesome. Um, yeah, if a cute kid walks in, we'll keep the cute kid. But, you know, if like a trash panda or something walks through the window, we may not keep that. If, uh, if it's like super out of tune or the audio is not good, probably not going to share if you, this is a family friendly thing. We had a guy send us a thing one time with, that was not family friendly. Definitely not sharing that. Um, so yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Uh, on YouTube, somebody just said about, uh, like, yeah, there's, there's a video like this on YouTube that we did, uh, as part of our from classical to radical series. Um, if you search multiple violins, on our YouTube channel, there is a video that I did from my home studio where I was talking about how to make your violin sound um, like a string section. Um, talk about some of the technical challenges on that and then the way that you can do it. Chinese twang. I actually actively avoid that sound. So, um, yeah, I, that's, that's not my thing at all. If you've got a thing where you're making uh, a sound that you haven't heard us make, and you want to share that and it's uh it's a good quality video and there's like no naked people in it or anything uh send it to us and if uh if we can we'll share it okay so uh thank you all for hanging out and we will see you uh next time maybe next week maybe two or three weeks